test, test. Okay, good. Yeah, it sounds really good. <laughs> it's a, the bread doctor. Uh, yeah, I would say. <laughs> All right, so let's take you back. I'll give you the backstory because I think that is, that's important, give you context, right? So 12 years ago, well, I should say a long time ago, <laughs> my parents uh, in the 60s were trying to have a baby, right? And they could not have a child for the life of them. They just couldn't, I mean, complications and there was something wrong with my mother and um, they tried for 16 years, Sean, to try to have a kid. My, my, my wife went through two rounds of IVF to have our son. Really? Yeah. And so I know what it's like to try and fail. And, um, but for 16 years, bro, trying to have a, trying to start a family, it, it just didn't work. So medicine got better and they finally get to this doctor and he figures out what's wrong with my mom. So she goes in for a quick surgery and couple months later I'm conceived right so I'm just thinking bro 16 years trying anything for 16 years and not being successful whoa there's a lot of persistence there there's a lot of grit and and so I would always hear my mother God rest her soul tell this story about how I was her miracle baby and that it took 16 years to have me and I was like really like women are pregnant for 16 years <laughs> yeah big shout to all the moms out there so but i realized that 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 wasn't the case and so that story alone has been such a driver in my life to instill that never give up mentality in my in my mind and in my dna and so that's where this this grit and this this failure is not an option attitude and mentality comes in now fast forward two years um great day in new jersey my mom's in the kitchen cleaning up i'm in my room having a having a, a, a cat nap she walks into my room i'm blue and unresponsive two years old two years old, two years old. dude so they rushed me to the hospital and for, this is what I know, I don't know the whole story. My father to this day won't even talk about it. But uh, I lost all the salt in my body and my body started to like shut down. And uh, so they revived me and I hear that story being told by my mom again. And I say, holy shit, I'm here on borrowed time. I'm here on borrowed time. So I need to make the best out of this life that I was given as a gift. Honestly, to the best that I can. And that's my outlook today, and it will be until the day that I die. No, not at all. Um, but I, I always wanted to know. Remember that show back in the day, Rescue 911? Right? And we're going back, right? So my father, we would watch that show religiously, like as a family. And anything about a child being in distress, my father would get up and leave or he would turn it off. It was that big of an impact on him, okay? My father's a big guy, 6'3". He was 280 at the time. He's, he's, he's gotten much healthier since, but um, he would leave the room. I wouldn't understand why. And then I figured it out. It, it, was, it was a serious traumatic event in his life. Um, so fast forward my whole life, you know, I've always wanted to be something make something of myself, right? Unfortunately, my parents went through a horrible divorce. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, what happened was, you know, uh, my mom had it rough since day one. My whole mom's side of the family had it rough since day one. Is your mom from Jersey? Yeah, 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 up north, uh, Bergen County. Okay. She, was, she was born in Hackensack, New Jersey. Okay. And, um, but they had a rough life. Pop, my grandfather was, was, <laughs> was an interesting fellow. Uh, my grandmother, I only met her a couple times, so she was, she, they had their differences or whatnot, but she had it rough, right? And so when she became a parent, it was a game changer for her, despite what she went through, you would think, right? 
she had a very rough time transitioning into parenthood. And I think what happened was she just, she just couldn't do it. Like it, she was just, she just was like, okay, I'm, I'm done. And, and not to say that their relationship, it was it, it didn't have everything to do with parenthood. My relation, their relationship together as husband and wife were, because my dad's no, no spring, no, no easy guy to get along with either. Right. So, right. But, um, long story short, that split, that split, they split up, and my the the judge at the time actually gives custody to my dad, and that's very it's very different, it's unheard of. So my dad spent the basically dedicated his entire life to raise me. Wow. So when I'm growing up, I'm growing up. So my dad's very miserly. He 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 probably has the same the first nickel he ever made, right? But the guys you wouldn't know what that guy's net worth is by looking at him. Right. But this guy, you know, I don't know what he has, but, you know, we'll, we'll get to the story in a second. Uh, I don't know what he's got saved, but man, let me tell you, we lived miserly. I get my, I would get my school clothes from Canal Street. Really? Yeah. He would, he would bring me once in a fall and bring me once in a spring. And I, I was the, I was, I would wear those bootleg, you know, Carl Canai jeans and those Bacco jeans and the fake Nautica sweatshirts. And, and, and golf tees, like that's where I got my clothes. Yeah. And so it was very interesting growing up. So my, my mom had a very, very wealthy brother. Okay. He built a empire construction company. I mean, this thing, any, if you just cross the river and see any of the red trucks, you'll know exactly who that is, oh, wow. right? And so he builds this $200 million construction company as we're growing up and he's he's like lifestyles that are rich and famous so i would come up and visit my father would drop me off and i would spend the weekend uh with my cousins and stuff like that and i would see this lavish life and i would see this respect that this guy demanded and then i would go back to like mm. not poverty i'm not gonna call it poverty i never went without a meal I never went without clothes on my back, but we lived a very simple life. Yeah. And so I struggled with that my whole entire life. Like, I want that. Like, I, I want that, 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 that fame and that fortune, really. And then I, and then I, I came back to like, like, in my opinion, it was poverty, but it wasn't. And I struggled with that for so many years. So I said, when I become old enough, I will have the nicest things in life because that's, that's what I want. And, and so that's what I did. And I'm, so I go through college, four years of college, hated it, but I'll never regret the experiences. Okay. Like I'll never regret the experiences because I wasn't, I don't remember a goddamn thing that I learned in college other than the personal experiences mm. that I learned just by being there on campus, yeah. right? Uh, then I get out into corporate world, which is right after 9-11, so nobody was hiring. So I go to Uncle Joe and I said, Uncle Joe, I know uh, I've, been, I've been busting my ass trying to get my resume out. I can't get anybody to hire me. And he said, well, let me, let me chop it around. Let me see what I can do. Yeah. So now he's building the children's hospital at Hackensack Medical Center. Yeah, and they name it after him. To this day, it's named after him. So he br he brings my resume there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we so so I get in there, entry level position. It's very interesting though. Uh, there's a there's a story that's that comes here. So I get the call. I go for the interview, and they literally open up this book for me, and they were like, "What do you want?" And I'm like. Well, what do you got? <laughs> a book of positions available. So I'm like, well, this is different from my last interview. You're literally opening up the book telling me what to pick. I, this is interesting. So I go for like, I'm going for all like the lead, like the management and like director positions and the Maggie McKenna, God rest her soul. I remember her name. She's like, I hate to say this, Henry, but you're just out of college and you don't have any experience and there nobody's going to put you in that position regardless of who you know. Yeah. So let me put you in this position over here 
and uh, let me know what you think. Now, it was a insurance registrar. So if you were coming in for a same day surgery, I had to check your insurance in to make sure that you had insurance. That that guy, right? So I was like, what's this position pay? And she was like, 32,000. 32,000. Now, right out of school, I had, you know, I, I, I would have been like, okay, but living in North, well, I wasn't living in North Jersey at the time, but 32,000 salary right out of school, that wasn't in my cards. I was like, what, what about 50, right? But that's in my head, but I, I had no idea what to do at this point, right? So I get out of the, I get out of that interview and I get a phone call from my aunt. And my aunt was like, oh, Uncle Joe heard he had that interview today, but he didn't hear from you. So he wanted, he was nervous. He didn't know how it went. So I said, is he there? And she said, yeah. I said, all right, let me talk to him. So I talked to him and he said, so how'd it go? I says, well, you know, it's an entry level position. It's 32,000. And you know, I don't know what, I don't know what to do at this point. And he said, tell me what 50. Like, Uncle Joe, 50. And he was like, what? you don't believe you deserve that or you're not worth that. He says to me. And I said, well, I don't know. He said, tell me you want 50 and, 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 and be done. And that just like that. Right. And, and so I said, I, I said, okay. <laughs> so I go back to, I go back to Maggie. <laughs> That's exactly how it looked. <laughs> I was shaking. My hands were quivering. And uh, I go back and, and I tell her, I says, um, yeah, this position is probably a right fit for me, but you know, can we negotiate the salary? I, you know, I was, I was you know, like uh, nah, 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 50. <laughs> and she was like, um, yeah, unfortunately, Henry, we have a cap at this position. And I think she was like um, 42 or something like that, right? Like we can only go 42, uh, but I could probably get you like 38. And Uncle Joe was like, whatever they offer you, just take it. Just take it and we'll move you up. So I, I took it. And so now mind you, I'm in under his name and the, and there was no interview. It was, you start on Monday. So I get to this position and there was this woman there who was there since the first brick, right? So she's like, oh, another, another, uh, Another head honcho's relatives getting a job. We're gonna we're gonna torment the hell out of him and get him the, get him out of here. That's exactly what they did. They entrapped me. Some from day one, they would work me till about noon doing what I was supposed to do, and then they would put me in the waiting room and make sure that the coffee pots were clean. Oh really? That's how she would. That's how she did it. it yep. And, and 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 until I would just be fed up and leave. And so I got to my, just about two weeks out of my 90 day, uh, and they were just, they were throwing me to the sharks, man. I mean, they would set me up. They, they knew that the guy didn't have insurance and they would see what I would do. You know, it was bad. And um, I failed miserably, but I went to my boss's boss and I said, Tara, this is what's going on. I have it all documented from day one. What do I do? And she was like, well, I will talk to her and see what's going on. And I'll start to think of some other options for you. So long story short, what happens is she's like, you know what? She comes back like two weeks later. Now I'm nervous. I don't know what was going on in those two weeks. She comes back two weeks later and she says, you know what? 2,000 hours a, a, a year working for somebody that you don't get along with is a lot of time. So you know what? We're, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you upstairs in the breast center. You're going to do the same thing. I don't know if it's more money or not, but that's where you're going to start come June. Okay, fine. That works. So I go up there. It winds up to be $4 more an hour. So it was like a promotion. And so I get up there doing the same thing, much different atmosphere, and I just start hustling my butt off up there, just going above and beyond, doing everything that I can to just like stand out. I started joining uh, committees that directors and upper management were involved in. And I just wanted to be somebody in that, in that organization. Dude, like 23, I was like 23, 24. Then I find out that they can, they will pay for your master's degree or higher ed if you want. And so I said, let's do it. So I sign up Fairleigh Dickinson university for a master's degree program in business management. 
they paid 90% of it. I get my master's degree at 23 years old, thinking I'm gonna go right into a management position right after I graduate, right? Nope. No experience, no position, period. So I hustle my butt off for about another year and a half and I finally get this position at the children's hospital, <laughs> coincidentally. But so my name's still attached to my uncle, but there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of reputation now behind my name, right? So that boss at the time said, okay, he hired me. I went through like five interviews. He would not hire me on the spot. So I had to work for this one. So I get into an air and finally, uh, basically what the position was, it was a, um, special events director for sudden infant death syndrome. So basically what I, my responsibility was to create fundraising events to raise money to support the, the families in the state of New Jersey who lost a, a baby to SIDS. So I would raise the money and then spend the money on SIDS family services. And I would bring these families together from all over the state and we would do like support so I, I would take him to, one year I took him to Dorney Park, one time, uh, well, we, for two years I took him down to Point Pleasant and we rented out the section of the boardwalk and we did all types of stuff there. Yeah, yeah. So I did all of that for a couple of years and then I, 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 like, I feel like I like caught a break. So I'm, I'm scheming my next job, my next fundraiser and I was like, you know what, let me go big this time. I'm going to email Danielle Monero from Z100, from the Z Morning Zoo, right? And I'm going to see if she'll sponsor an event. So cold turkey email right out. And two days later, she wrote back. She said, Henry, totally interested. Would love to talk to you. Here's my number. Give me a call Friday at blank. So I call and I, I'm like, nervous as hell because I'm talking to Danielle Monero, right? So we're talking and she's like, I'm totally in. Uh, let me talk it over with Elvis and see what else we can do to help you and we'll go from there. So she comes back about a week later and she says, Elvis wants you. So she does this like late night show. Well, at the time she was doing this late night show, um, like community outreach and stuff like that. She says, I want you and the lead doctor, Dr. Pearl at the time, that handled a lot of the SIDS cases. Uh, I want you to both come into the studio. I want to interview you, and we're going to promote the heck out of the event. So she brings me to the studio, and we record the whole event. Now, I'm, I'm, the doctor can't even believe this, that this is all going down. She was like, he said, man, you, you, hit, you hit a home run this time, Henry. And I was like, oh, man, that was cool. So, you know, earned my stripes there, right? I, I got some... Got some um, so we, so we do this whole event. It was called Rock Out for a Reason. And one of my buddies was a club promoter. So we did it at his club. And yep. And I needed all the marketing materials to market this thing. So at the time, I didn't even know what graphic design was. But Jerry was a graphic designer. And so I sat next to him on a Sunday. His mom was cooking pasta in the, in the other room. And we designed all the marketing materials for this event. And I'm sitting there watching him design this flyer and I'm going, whoa, creative, graphic design. What is this world? And I just become enamored by design. And I said to Jerry, I need to learn this. What is the movie Communication. Okay. It was so broad. Nope. One thing my mother gave, so I got the best of both worlds in my family. So my father's very, very quiet. Right, but he's a, he's he's very business savvy. He's a very he's an excellent negotiator. He's a teamster, so they put him in charge of the negotiation mm -hmm. and all of that. So very very smart business man, um, hard worker, strong work ethic. But he's not the light of the party yeah. by any means. My mom, she'll walk into a room of fifty people, four hundred people, five thousand people, and by the end of the night, she's best friends with everybody. Yeah. Right, so I got the best of both worlds here, best of the best of both personalities. So that's what happened. And so what happened was I come in and I start leveraging my personality. And that's what I believe got me to where I'm at today and, and my strong work ethic. My father had me working when I was 13. I was pushing carts at Food Town, right? And so I, I knew what it was to work, right? I earned my money. 
right? It was just, it just wasn't given to me. And so that was a great, that was a great life lesson. So fast forward, we do the event. It was awesome. And I'm like, all right, how do I convince my boss to buy me the Photoshop program so I could start doing all the in-house stuff on myself by myself and learning the trade? I get her to do it and I just go to town and I'm just doing all the events. I'm doing all the invites and posters and all of that. And I start to build up this skill set. And I'm pretty damn good at it. It was just one of those natural things that come to you. And so I'm like, okay, I see there's something here. I don't know what, but there's something here. So I start outside of work, I start side hustling. And I start reaching out to all these different nightclubs and... and no, 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 uh, 2004, 2004, five. Yeah, so 2004 and five, I'm, no one knows who I am. I'm just building my skill set. Around 2006, <laughs> it's like PS3 or something, right? <laughs> So we, um, so we get to, we get to a turning point. So the hospital goes through some serious issues and they start downsizing like crazy and they just cut like a good tremendous amount of people like staff wise. And so I start to feel like a little bit of a pinch. So what's happening is they're cutting half of my, my day in half and basically having me file papers for another director for half the day. And I start to see what's going on here. And I'm like, wait a second, master's degree. I'm, th I'm, I'm 27 or eight years old. I feel like I'm going backwards. Right. Like I have, all, and so I need to figure this out. So I start hustling more on the side. And finally they gave me an ultimatum. They said, well, here's what's going on, Henry. In January, you're gonna be cut, your hours are gonna be cut in half you're gonna be working half as a administrative assistant for somebody and um, it's up to you if you wanna stay. They wouldn't fire me, but they were like, it's up to you if you wanna stay. Yeah. So I'm like, mm, I don't know, man, I don't know. I, my business isn't to where I want it to be. I'm making some money, but so I go to Uncle Joe and I go, Uncle Joe, here, another life lesson here. I meet him on a Saturday morning in his office, like seven in the morning, this guy works like 5 a.m. He's, he's at the office like Brioni suit, like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, this guy, this guy makes John Gotti back in the days look like a, a Muppet. Yeah, I mean, this guy knows how to dress. So I, 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 I show up at his office and he says, I, you know, my son told me you want to talk to me. And I said, yeah, here's what's going on. So I tell him the whole story and he's like, well, what are you asking me? And I said, well, is there maybe a position here I can work? <laughs> and he's like, what do you want to do here? It's just, this is heavy highway construction. And I said, well, I don't know. Like my cousin Joe, you, you hired his friends and they do like project management stuff. That looks pretty cool. He's like, Hank, they used to call me Hank. Hank, they, they went to school for this stuff. Like they, they, they spent their whole life doing this. They're like, this is their, this is their livelihood. Like, you don't know anything about construction. And I said, no, I know, but I'll learn. <laughs> and he goes, here, here's the deal. He said, I mean, I don't want to put you behind a shovel because you're a pretty smart guy. And he said, but my, my concern is when things get slow, do I want to lay off my nephew, right? Or what if you botch up a big job? Do I, do, do I have to have that conversation with you? And that is a very hard conversation to have with a family member. He says, but here's what I'll do. I'll talk to my, my daughter because she's like the CEO. And I'll talk to the, pre the other pres the president and I'll see if we can figure something out for you and I'll get back to you. I said, okay. <laughs> and he never did. He never did. And I didn't even follow up. Never brought it up. And, and I just left it. And, I, and, and it was like one of those signs from God or wherever that wasn't meant to be. No, maybe at the time I was like, well, that's effed up, but I saw a big picture there. It was that it was, that was the nudge off the ledge that I needed to say, I'm out hospital. I got this and I will do this on my own in entrepreneur world. 26, 
26. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was hustling, dude. I would come home with with pockets full of cash from the clubs because they would just pay you in cash at the end of the day. At the end of the night, they'd pay you out for doing all of their club club work, like the flyer work. And yeah, and that's where I got my start. And so Jerry was connected in the nightlife industry. So I used my connection and he started saying, hey, Henry does flyers. Well, just use him. Like he's, he's a solid guy. I taught him because I can't do it anymore. I'm busy. One after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And the only reason why I got the work that I got was because I was mega fast. So I saw where people, I saw the value that the promoters in the nightclubs were looking for, and it was speed. So I was like, I may not be the best designer right now, but I will kill my competition with speed. And that's what I did. I just ran circles around my competition. They couldn't get it done fast enough, so all the work started coming to me. And I just started sucking all the work away from them. And literally, that was when the print business was big too. So I had a, I had a guy who would print 5,000, 10,000 flyers for me at a clip and that was where I was making a lot of my money. And so I, would, I was everything in my business. I was the designer, I was the salesperson, I was the delivery boy, I was everything. And I, that's how I built this, this empire that I have today and we'll, we'll get there. So I start doing that. And then I meet my wife and then we get married and then the nightlife industry is no more. And I'm starting to hate my life because I'm working literally 20 hours a day, six days a week. And I don't know. I remember this day, clear as day. It was a Saturday. It was 4.30 p.m. It was springtime. And I walked into my kitchen to get a drink just to like take five. And I said, is this what my life is going to be like at 50. 27. <laughs> 27, 28. Yeah, 28. Yeah, about two years gone by. And I was still grinding like a mofo. And I said, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, nickel and dime in me, you know, the, the jobs, I went from $50 to $30 to $25 a pop. It, it was a race to zero. And I was like, I'm not making the money that I used to, but I'm working three times, five times more. And then competition came in and just started undercutting me. I'll do it for 20, don't worry about it. How do you compete with that? So now you become a commodity. So what gets worse is Fiverr comes out. Yeah, so yeah, so Fiverr came out like 2012. So I was about 32. Yeah, I think that yep, yeah, like 2012, 2013. Fiverr comes out and disrupts the whole market. Designers like me were getting paid $300 for a brochure. Now $5? You can't compete. So I said if I can't beat these guys, I'm going to join them. So I become a Fiverr designer just to keep the wheel spinning because San Hurricane Sandy comes through wipes out two of my giant clients, liquor companies. So I got connected with two liquor companies through a client who owned a restaurant and they were pumping me like quarter of a million dollars worth of work a year. It was massive and I would just crank. And, and Sandy comes in and blows them to smithereens and when they come and restructure, they, all, they, they brought everything in house. And they said, Henry, we can't, we're not going to use you no more. We restructured everything since the storm. And so I can't make up 225 grand or 250,000. I can't, I can't make it up. So that, so I start going into Fiverr and I start, so I'll never forget this woman. She pays me five bucks for a two sided business card design. And I spent six hours on a job with uh, in revisions. No. But but do the but do the math. She paid five bucks. I spent six hours on the job. It was maybe thirty cents an hour, fifteen cents an hour, something like that. It was something stupid. And I that day I fin I finalized the job. I sent it to her, and I said thank you. This is my last day on Fiverr. And so now, mind you, another life lesson coming along here. I was hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging money. 
So no kids yet. Yeah, no, no kids yet. So I'm hemorrhaging money. Wife has no clue. We're still going on trips. I still got the Range Rover. I still am Diamond Jim Brady, and n nobody knows nothing, right? And I'll never forget. Yeah, it was horrible. You're you're you're, you're living two lives, right? So I'm at the uh, uh, I'm at a family uh, in laws on a Sunday barbecue. They live on Lake Mohawk up in Sparta, New Jersey. Beautiful, and uh, everyone's having a blast, and I'm miserable because I'm like, what am I gonna do tomorrow? <laughs> like I don't have any money left. I just have some cash in a safe, and that ain't gonna get me too far. So that night I go home. And we're sitting and we're watching Real Housewives of Orange County. And this dude brings his wife out to lunch to tell her he's bankrupt and the business is finished. <laughs> so you want to talk about, wow. you want to talk about serendipity or whatever you want to call it. Wow. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, so you were, uh, so that's from your new conversation. <laughs> With my wife. So I said to her, now my wife's 100 pounds, 5'2", five 5'1". Five with heels maybe. So I says, Tor, we, we got to talk. I turned the TV off. And I said, we got to talk. I said, business is horrible. And I don't know what to do. I don't have any money in the bank left. And I just have, I don't know, 16, I, 16 grand in cash in the safe. I don't know what to do. So she looks at me and she's like, how'd this happen? And I told her. And she goes, okay. She's like, all right, I'll be right back. Now, it was 30 seconds to my bedroom, to my office, to grab the laptop, but it felt like 30 hours. She comes back in, jumps on the bed, opens up the laptop, and I always tell the story. I said, I don't know if we were looking for divorce attorneys at that point or, or where, where we're looking. She's going to help me, right? She opens up the laptop. She looks me in the face, and she goes, let's get to work. Wow. And I'll never forget that because she was there before I had anything, before I had two dimes to rub together. She was there when Unique Designs was two months old. So she saw the progress, she saw how it grew. And so she starts helping me with, so she's a marketer in her own world. She works for a big publishing company and um, so she's got this marketing mindset. So she starts helping me find coaches and find uh, how we can differentiate and what kind of promos we could put out there. She's, so we're sitting there for three hours trying to put this all together. Now I'm still, shaken up because I'm, I feel defeated. I feel lost. I feel like I let her down, my father down, myself down. I shouldn't, do I deserve to be in business anymore? Like why, what am I doing here? And I said, all right, we don't have time to think about that. We need to get to work here. So I go online and I, I and I'm getting targeted, I guess because of the sites that I was looking at, I'm getting targeted on Facebook. And I find this $1 trial for this company called digitalmarketer.com. And they were like, dollar trial for our, our engage group. It's a, it's a private Facebook group and you get all these, all these trainings for free. All right, I got a dollar. I'll just give it a shot for a dollar. So I sign up, I paid a dollar and I get into this Facebook group and these people are talking shit about digital marketing all oh, way over my head. I didn't even know what an upsell was. I had no idea what a lead magnet was. I had no idea. They're talking all this, all this industry talk and I had no idea what I, was, what I was getting myself into. But somebody keeps talking about this ClickFunnels software. And, and, and so I'm like, what is this? So I go over there and I start navigating through this ClickFunnels software and I'm like, whoa, this is a website builder that you don't need to code. You don't need any coding involved. You could design, and I was a pretty good designer, but you could design these websites in this, in this software, and I don't need to learn how to code. So I'm gonna jump in there. Maybe I can start designing websites. So I jump in, and I'm like lost because it's a learning curve in this software. So, so I just start doing my thing, and then the, the founder of the company has this podcast. So I start listening to his podcast. I start resonating with this guy like, like he's my homie. Russell Brunson, his name is. So he keeps talking about this coaching program, this inner circle program. I'm like, what the hell is this program? So I find it online and I apply to be part of it. So I get this salesman on the other line and he tells me it's a $25,000 mastermind group. 
Yeah, I'm like, I don't have a pot to piss in here. Never mind 25 grand to be in this coaching program. So I was like, this is out of my league, Robbie. There's no way in hell I'm going to be able to do this. Who's paying these things? Are they typically companies that are paying for their employees to do these things? No, just entrepreneurs that are doing good, that are looking for mentorship and guidance, right? So he says, well, hold on a second. I may have, Russell may have this other program that may be a better fit. So he says, we have this other program. It's 10 grand. I never spent 10 grand in my life. Uh, uh, right. So I said, what do I do? If I don't pay this, I'm going to be in the same rut I am tomorrow. It's a huge risk. It's a, it's a, yeah. One thing I had was credit. My dad said, always pay your bills on time. And I did have credit. And so I said, Robbie, if I could pay five now and five over the next five months, would you do it? And he said, yeah. So boom, I threw the five grand on the, on the card. And I said, I got a month to figure it out. So I jump on the first call with Russell after, once I get into the program. And it's a 60 minute call. And I tell him my whole story, literally what I just told you guys. And he's hysterical crying. I'm hysterical crying. And he said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I need help with my first book launch. And you're going to be the guy that helps me design all the marketing materials. What is it going to cost me? And I was like, I don't know. And he said, well, get back to me tomorrow. I need you. I need your help. You have an amazing skill set that is going to help me tremendously. He turns around and pays me six grand. I had a conversation with him once. Talk about the power of story. So great story with great skill set. What happens? In my, at the time, miracles. <laughs> and so that let, so I, I, I paid, I was able to pay that bill off on Amex. And then within 16 months after that, I got my shit together. I had $500,000 in revenue generated. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you, so you, you said you, you would do it. You had a conversation. You said, I'll pay you end up paying six grand to do his traffic. Yep. Before, yep. And then here's what happens. So his book launches. I start getting my feet deeper into ClickFunnels design. I start serving that industry, that community alone with design work. Now I had a, so I start generating some, some serious cash from that. Now, not to say that I fell a few times hard on my ass. With the clip yeah, because I didn't know what I was doing, but I was charging for it. And to be honest with you, like I didn't know, I shouldn't have been. I should have been still learning the program. So you were doing click funnels, funneling towards your graphic? Well, no, I was serving the, the community. So other people needed funnels designed, like click funnels designed. And Russell was referring me out to them saying, oh man, you gotta use my guy. And- I the people that were paying 25 dollars they have money to spend. Nope. So the ClickFunnels community, I think we're getting mixed up here. So the, the mastermind group that I was part of, it wasn't the 25K group, it was this little 10K group. So I got involved in there and basically what I was doing in, so I was networking in there and some people in that community uh, uh, paid for my service and I would do design work for them. And that's where I started to generate some revenues. But Russell started to really teach me digital marketing. And he said, if there's one thing, if you wanna make 20 grand a month, cause I, at the time I was only making like eight, right? If you wanna make 20 grand a month, you need to replace yourself and you need to build a team. And I was like, how the hell do I do that? And he said, well, I don't have all the answers for that, but that's what you need to do. You need to figure that out. And so I'm like, okay. So I find this mentor, if you will, in this Ignite program, in this, in this coaching program. And I, start, I pay him six grand after I started generating some revenue for like a mindset coaching, because mm -hmm. I felt like I needed it. My head was so far up my ass, Sean. Because I didn't, I came into money real quick in my early 20s. And I told you how I grew up. So I just spent every dollar I made. And not only that, I let the money get to my head. And, and you know, people say, 
you know, you, there's that there's that old there's that meme out there, right? Money doesn't make you happier. It just exposes who you really are. It makes you more of what it is who you really are. And I became a real son of a bitch. I mean, my family on my mom's side still doesn't talk to me to this. Yeah, to this day. Well, I was I I pissed a lot of people off. I would I was I yes I was very condescending. I was very selfish. Yes, I was very selfish. Um, I flaunted a lot. Like I flaunted a lot. I had a I had a, a, f- a full size Range Rover when I was like twenty three, and I was like, look at me, look at me. Like I don't need Uncle Joe. I don't need Uncle Joe's money. I'll make it myself, right? And that that's me pounding my chest, Captain Ego, right? And that pissed a lot of people off. You know, there's a there was there was rumors out there that my uncle said in conversation, there's no way Henry's driving a Range Rover selling business cards. He's selling drugs. Oh, really? I don't know if it's true or not. I never confronted him on it, but that hurt a lot. Yeah. All right. That hurt my feelings a lot. Here's a guy I looked up to like God, aside from my father. You and I do. No, no, I do. And, um, but maybe, but not often. You know, we maybe see each other at a family event or something that my cousin's throwing, but my other aunts and all, they don't talk to me. They, they, they just kind of like, once I got married, I was like exiled from the, from the, from, from the family. And it was a life, it's, you know, it's, 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 Jim Rohn talks about this a lot, right? He was like, looking back, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? And if I look back and realized how much that, success was going to cost me i probably wouldn't have done it i probably wouldn't have done it Hmm. yeah i i i because you know what at the end of the day like family's everything you have and now not to say my family's on that side you know we can write a book we can write we can have a netflix series easy (laughs) just from the history right there's a long history in that family dating back to the 30s Okay, so long story short, I look back and I say, you know, if I could go back and change some things, I probably would have gave more of that money to people who really needed it, like that couldn't help themselves. No clue, no clue. So not to regress, not to digress, but I we we fast forward. Russell really taught me the the ins and outs of digital marketing. I, I said to myself, I need to increase the value that I'm bringing to the marketplace. Otherwise I'm going to be a commodity and I'll be, I'll be washed out to sea. And one of the things I knew that I needed to really understand is strategy. Like there's nothing in the world that you're ever going to get paid more for than you're thinking. Cause that's not a commodity. That is one thing that cannot be commoditized. And so I partnered up at the time with a strategist. He, that's all he did was strategy. So I partnered with him. I split my business literally in half with him. Yeah, for, yeah, pretty much for about a year. And then I realized, wait a second, I could do this shit. Like I see the framework that he's working off of. Why should I give him half of my business? Meanwhile, my team's doing all the design work. Like we're doing all of the heavy lifting. He's just coming in and doing the strategy, but I'm still giving him 50% of everything. I said, this doesn't work for me anymore. And so I just parted ways. I just, I just woke up one day and said, you know what, David, I think we're going to dissolve this partnership. And one of the things I realized was the work that we did together, like we would bring in the, I would bring in most of the business. The business was all of the leads were generating through my personality online. Hmm. You just take it 50. Now, listen, that's a good deal. If I was him, I would sh- I would keep my mouth shut and just let that let that ride ride that wave, baby. So I can't fault them for that. But when I woke up, I said, David, I appreciate all of the, the, all of what you have done, but we're gonna dissolve this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my thing. And he said, fine. So we made sure we 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 yeah we cleaned everything up to the best of our ability, and that was it. And I went on to generate. So we did pretty good. Like two months with him, first two months with him, we generated like 180,000 in revenue. 
And then I realized, holy crap, I can do this. I can do this. I can do these numbers on my own. I know it. I just got to give myself freaking credit and just do it. And so now I look back and like now I can show you my QuickBooks, Sean. Like it's crazy. Like this this year alone, 2019, we're up to $210,000 in revenue. It's three, not even three months in, right? Two and a half months in, 210K generated. And like I always show, I, I snap pictures of this too. And, and people think like you're ballsy for that. Like what? Like, yeah, why are you showing us your revenues? And I'm like, well, I just want to show and prove that I'm, 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 I practice what I preach. Well, you know what? You know what that does, though? Because we can shit talk all you want, but the numbers speak. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I circle, Sean? I circle my net. I circle my net. Right. Because there's out people out there going, oh, I did a million dollars this month. But they spent nine hundred and ninety nine thousand to get it. You listen to all these click on where like you could get you know all from that's you know it's all gross. It's all gross. And I've actually looked at some of them too and they're talking about you know they're making twenty thousand a week. But then they're net they would never just get the net and just look like having that and Yeah. So I'm showing people how much I spend. You know, so we did eighty grand this month. What? Uh, your, your is oh, so we, <laughs> talk about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? What, who, what drug dealer are you getting all your coke from? No, it. So I transformed my design skill set into a branding agency, specifically for, and it's very boutique. Like we work with six and seven figure entrepreneurs that are purpose driven brands. They want to make this world a better place through their expertise. And there's a, believe it or not, you know, there is a, there is a big pool of these people that have a great product or service and they are not branded properly to showcase their true net worth. And I am on a hell bent mission to help those folks create a brand that they're proud to promote and that truly represents their net worth. And so I've built out a team. I took Russell's advice and spent a lot of money building infrastructure of my business. And what I did was I started with a project manager and said, this is the designer we need for this area of branding. This is the designer we need for this area. And so we built out a team of 15 people. Pam manages everyone. And I have strategists around my team. Right. So I took the was it Napoleon Hill talked about the mastermind mentality. Right. And so I have key people. So I Sean, I hire, including yourself, you're part of the team. You just don't know it. I hire specialists, not generalists. So I need a personal brand photographer. I'm coming to Sean Tory. OK, I need a Facebook ads guy. I'm going to Todd. He's I've known him for a couple of years and. It's just we have a great relationship, and I hired him and his partner to run all my Facebook advertising. I need a YouTube strategist. I need somebody to help me position myself properly on YouTube because it's a quick. It's easy to go down the wrong rabbit hole and then have to fix, and I don't want to do that. I'm trying to cut that curve, so I hire this. I hire this guy, um, uh, Stephen Marinaro. He's actually featured in Gary V's Crushed It book. He's one of the chapters. Yeah, so he he helps me strategize my YouTube channel. Um, then I have a social media branding, uh, brand identity specialist. So that team just does graphic design for social media identity. I have a ClickFunnels team. That's all they do is ClickFunnels design and, and development. I have a, a landing page designer who does all my website design. Um, I have a developer. That's all he does is develop. You see how I just categorized everybody? Nobody's, nobody's spread too thin, and they just do what they love to do. That's what I learned in my master's degree. So I want to laugh. I used none of what I've learned in my master's degree in my corporate life. When I got to become an entrepreneur, everything that I learned in my master's degree is getting implemented. It just happened to take... 12 years later. <laughs> of course. So your team that you built is part of it in the end of the lifetime. Yeah, I'm good. Is, um, 
for marketing for your own business and driving a company client thing in the end project. Doing it. Yeah. What you're doing could pretty much be applied to just about any business, you know? Any business. I'm very specific on who I want to work with and who I don't want to work with. So one of the things that I've started to see is this. When you start to serve this particular marketplace of influencers, and I'll, I'm going to call it what it is, you work with big egos. And I'm not interested in working with big egos. So I put an Instagram post out yesterday. And I, and I purposely did this because I want to draw the line in the sand. I said, I don't design for big egos. I design for audiences who are starving for a quality product and service. Like that. That's who I design for. And in the description, I said, if you're an influencer that wants a logo to be blue because that's your favorite color, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> Okay, if your audience doesn't like the color blue and doesn't resonate with the color blue and doesn't like your logo or doesn't like your messaging, you don't have a business, do you? So we need to take ourselves out of the equation and design for our audience, not for our selfish reasons. Some people can stomach that, some people can't. But I wanna work with the people that can because they're a higher caliber client and they're a higher caliber entrepreneur. I did it. What are those steps you take to like go from one man to fifteen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's so many. It's easy not to all have the money. Oh my God! I can't even pay this person five hundred a week, and they're not going to get the five hundred. And then like you have to pay high like, well, quality. To get high like, quality, oh, I need to pay. I can't afford it. Fifty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars a year to someone. I'm not even making that. Mm -hmm. So here's what one thing I realized. Of building a team is you have to treat them like family. You have to treat them like people. You can't treat them like disposable minions. Okay. And I see a lot of people. So my team is spread across four continents and four different time zones, but we still meet twice a week, twice a month. Right. And we still have that our powwows like family. And I don't necessarily give them bonuses like monetary bonuses, like Pam worked her ass off for me, her second year working with me. I sent her and her entire family to Universal Studios in Singapore. Wow. That's how I gave, that was my bonus for her. <laughs> and that's how I pay them, okay? If any of them show any interest in any sort of uh, course or education, I will pay it for them. Okay, but let me get, let me answer your question. Because, yeah, the, that's, that's like 20 miles down the road. Let's get back to what we need to do up front, just starting out. So what I did, I can only speak for myself. What I did was I real, I, 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 I documented the process on everything. What happens when a client comes in? How do we get the information to execute a beautiful design? What happens after that? How do we do revisions? I documented everything on video. I just recorded my screen and I said, this is how we onboard a new client. This is how we send a, a design revision. This is what we do two weeks after we uh, deliver a final product. We follow up and I documented everything in video. I uploaded those videos unlisted on YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel. And what I did was, let me back up. I hired somebody. He was 17 grand, but I hired him. We worked out a deal where I was able to pay that off over time because I didn't have it up front. Um, but I, he taught me how to do all of this. So I hired a systems guy. 
I reinvested, I, I made some money, and I reinvested in a systems and processes guy. And they taught me how to do this. I didn't come out of nowhere and start doing this because I knew what to do. I had no idea what to do. That's why I hired a, a specialist. So he said, this is what you got to do. Sean, it was awful. I spent hours recording myself talking on how to build out. But man, when I tell you it paid back, it paid me back in spades. Because what, what this guy did was he created this employee manual in literally Google, in Google Docs. He created like a, an employee handbook for my company. And we just uploaded all those videos, those URLs into the chapters of the handbook. And every time I onboarded a new employee, I would send them to that Google Doc and say, you got to read that before you can get a job. Before you, I hand you over a client project, you got to read that handbook. And we'll quiz you on it. right? Or before I hire you, I want you to do a test project for me to see how quickly you could turn this around and at the quality that I expect. And so Pam would go out to all of these different freelance sites where you can hire these freelancers. And we would put out extremely specific like uh, job postings. And so we would get back a very definitive applicant. And I would, me and Pam would basically bring them through the interview process. And then we got a little bit more savvier. She did a lot of the legwork up front for me. And then she would pick the candidates that I thought, that she thought would be best for me. And then I would only get three. So that saved me a shit ton of time. So then I would get three, just like, dude, just like getting hired out there in corporate world. That's how we hire, yep. right? So I would discuss my values with them. I would tell them my, what my non-negotiables were and what I truly expect out of them. And for me, it's communication and high quality work. I don't wanna be told on the 11th hour that you're not gonna deliver this project. I'd rather know 24 hours in advance and we can course correct at that point, right? They know that up front and they deliver. And so I have built this. Everybody on my team, there's one common denominator and we all value the same thing, quality work and communication. And so that's easy. When you got everybody on the same page, it's easy to scale because you're not waking up every morning going, oh, I hope Steven comes through today. Oh, I hope Melitz is going to get done with that project. It's due today. I don't know how people work like that. And I don't know how people run businesses like that. I'll tell you right now, there was a guy um, that might have, I had the back, I, there was a client that came through um, that maybe hired me too quickly, didn't do his research on me that quick, threw me a whole bunch of money up front. <laughs> and then got like queasy about it. And Sean, you know me a, a pretty long time. Like I don't have a deceitful bone in my body because that's not how I do business. And so I told, the, I told the client, listen, maybe we have to backtrack here. First off, I understand if I gave that kind of money up front without getting anything back physical or tangible, I'd be a little queasy too. So I empathize with you. But one thing I will tell you is I'm not going anywhere and my name is now attached to you in this project and that means more to me than this, this chunk of change you just gave me. So here's what, we need to th here's what we need to understand about each other. One, you have to hire who you trust and trust who you hire. Otherwise, you're not going to feel good about our relationship. Second thing is I would strongly advise that you go to my website and you learn about me. Listen to my podcast, watch my videos and get an understanding of how I work and where my values are. Because I know you, you don't, I know you more, better than you know me. And I can tell you that we are not cut from the same, I mean, we are cut from the same cloth. And because I know this guy going back a couple of years and it's just, it's ironic how we are now working together. And I said, we are not too different from each other. And I promise you that your values are very similar to mine, but you don't know that yet. So you're petrified. You think I'm gonna take this money and run, don't you? And he does. And so when I explained that to him, <laughs> it was a whole different conversation, right? So I was very upfront with them. 
And so I want to work with clients that align with my values, mm -hmm. right? And you know, uh, uh, me and my me and my wife have this conversation a lot. She's like, "Well, you're going to just get clients sometimes that are going to be difficult, and you just need to know how to work with them." To a point. To a point. I I agree with that statement to a point. But then there's a point where you have to draw the line in the sand and say, is this costing me too much? <laughs> As a creative in the photography space, you know what I'm talking about. It's it and it's and you start to question yourself <laughs> and there right. yeah. you start to doubt yourself and that if you ask me what's the one biggest entrepreneur killer in the planet it's doubt it's oh, yeah. it's doubt doubting yourself imposter syndrome so let me I'll share with I'll share another war story with you I mean we have we, yeah we have we have about 35 minutes left share another war story with you. So business is booming and doing good, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're back on tracks. I thought my processes and systems were flawless, no leaks, no cracks, we're good. We start bringing in some great work and s somehow I get this, cl this client comes in and he was a bad egg. And the, 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 the project goes crazy. Like it just goes off track and it's, it's bad at this point, right? He goes on to smear my name on the internet and take out, you know, like you could, you could get these bots to like put positive reviews on your sites, on platforms. Well, he reversed it. He had all these people put like negative reviews. I had to shut down my Facebook page, my business Facebook page. You can't remove them. So I just, just shut the page down. So a couple of other people came out of the woodwork, never told me that they were dis disappointed or, or unhappy. They came out of the woodwork and joined this guy's camp. And I had to refund like close to $45,000. <laughs> never mind, like between a couple clients and, right? <clears throat> so that put my whole business in a tailspin last year. And this is just, this is recent. And um, I had my son. And I went through, just like my mother did, some serious transitional issues into parenthood and fatherhood. Mm. I, it, the transition was not smooth for me at all. And this is right when all this crap goes down. And I made some really poor financial decisions. I went out and bought a $180,000 car. <laughs> right? Just to like get my mind off of everything. Like I deserve that. Yeah, it was awful, awful investment, awful investment. And so that, so that I did that first, then these people asked for all their money back. So now I'm in the hole. I don't even know how much money, dude. And I'm stuck. And I, I tell my father, I says, listen, this is what's going on. And I don't know what to do. My wife's on the break. Cause this is the second time it happened. Okay, this is the second time I put her through this. And she goes, you know, I'm, I'm done. Like, I don't know. I can't trust you anymore. Now we have a son. He was a couple months old. I don't know if I can go on like this. And now I'm like mortified. I have that pressure coming at me. I got no money coming in. I don't know how my audience is kind of perceiving me right now. I feel like a piece of shit. And I don't know how to get out of this black hole. Were you doing, were you doing videos and promoting yourself during that time 
Mm-hmm. That's what saved me, Sean. So this guy comes to the internet one morning. It was like a Friday night. It was like a Friday morning. I wake up to all of this social media noise. I've had, I had like cousins and like friends from like high school that are like friends with me on Facebook private message me saying, I got this weird PM overnight about how you're a scam artist and uh, that, I, that I shouldn't do business with you. Meanwhile, I, you know, you're like my cousin. <laughs> so he had these bots go out to all of my friends on Facebook and send them PMs. I guess you could do that. There's that th- technology out there that allows you to do that. So, and then my social media accounts all got swarmed by these, by these pe- and, and, and they were like from third world countries, like they couldn't even speak English, but they were like trashing me, like you could tell, right? So this was all botted work. So my wife goes into a panic. She goes into a panic. She's like, this could break your business. This could ruin you. And I said, I'm not, I don't, I don't, uh, listen, I've dealt with this before, but I don't know if this is going to ruin me because I had put myself out there quite a bit. So she writes a statement for me because if I did, it probably wouldn't have read too well. So she writes this statement for me and we put it out on my channels and she says, go away for the day. Just get off the internet. Don't do any work. Just go. And I did. And I just rode, drove around. I went down to the park and I just spent the whole day like outside. And I came back around seven o'clock that, that evening and went online. And I could, I could be in tears just telling you this. My community came to bat for me and completely destroyed this guy. Wow. And dug up so much dirt on this guy. This guy was a convicted felon. He embezzled $1.7 million from two senior citizen women. (laughs) So they dig all this up on him and they start posting that all over the internet. And you could see like, now I had refunded them. So he had calmed down at that point. I gave him all his money back that day and the other client's money. Pretty much. Yeah, it was tough. So, you know, it's funny. Karma's a bitch, right? So I find out. So I completely um, I completely block him from all channels whatsoever, right? So there was a few other people that actually came to, came to me that day and said, you know, he did this to me a year ago and I still have yet to come surface. I, and so this is a guy that, that, this guy did wrong. <laughs> and he said, I don't have the following like you did. So I had to just bury myself. And I, I've yet to come out and re, re, regroup. And that hurt me more than it. That there hurt me more than what he did to me. I said, this son of a bitch. So I did not retaliate. I didn't retaliate. I said, I'm better than this. I said, this guy's going to get his one day. And so what happened? About four, maybe four months later, five months later, I have an Instagram influencer that this jerk off, like just shafted all this money to and all of that. He comes to me and he says, hey, guess what happened to so-and-so? I says, what? He got shut down on Facebook and Instagram permanently. I was like, interesting. I was like, Really? Now, I don't know what he's doing. I mean, he's still out there scheming, but like, I don't know what he's, do- but Instagram and faith. So something happened. It, in terms, in terms of conditions and stuff. Yeah. So anyway, so karma's a real bitch. And like, I didn't even have to do anything to retaliate. And I'm not, that's not my guy. That's not like my, my, my personality. That's not how I get back at yeah. people. I, you don't want to put that out. You know, you don't want to put that energy out there. So that happens. But a couple life lessons. One is, Henry, you thought you were doing good work, but you weren't. So you got to step up. If you're going to charge this kind of money, then you got to step up and deliver like 10x that. And so I went back and looked at my processes and services, uh, processes and systems and saw some leaks. So what did I do? 
One was I struggled with sales a bad. I couldn't sell myself out of a paper bag, believe it or not, in a, in a systematic way. I hired a sales coach, OG, used to sell encyclopedias, right? So he gave me like the real grassroots framework, worked with him for a few months, and there was one thing he said to me. He said, Henry, and I was in this funk for months. Three, four months I was in this funk. I could not get out of it. I was in a deep depression. And we're talking. It was a Saturday morning. And Tom says to me, Henry, do you know why your windshield is bigger than your rearview mirror? And I said, why? He said, because you're not fucking going that way anymore. That was the fire that was lit under my ass that day. I went, uh, that was it. That was it. That was the slap across the face. And I said, that's it. I'm out. And I went and I said, what do I need to do next? I need to hire a business coach to really help me get my processes and systems in place that is in the same industry as me. I'm not hiring some guru. I'm hiring somebody who's kicking ass in my industry. And I said, I gotta go and learn from him. And so every morning I have a ritual. I get up at 645, I do my thing, I make sure my little guy's good and my wife's good. And I sit for an hour and I read or I listen or I watch. And I'm just YouTubing branding. And I just bump into this YouTube channel. And I start watching this Asian guy. Seems put together. Seems like he knows what he's talking about, okay? Start diving into some of his, some of his more videos. I, I go and buy $300 course. I start diving in deep. I go to his website. I see he's got a consulting there. I buy a $500 an hour consult. I sit down with him. I tell him where I'm at. He tells me what I should do. I go right in. That's one thing about me, Sean. I don't wait two seconds. If some coach, if my coach tells me I need to do this this way, that's done within 24 hours. That's the way I operate. And I would do it. And I would see a return. And then I, would, I, would, then I said, all right, I made this money. I'm going to take another five and I'm going to dump it back into him. And I would get another consult. And, I, and, I would, I would do, and then he raises his price. He goes, I can't. And he didn't do it to be a jerk off. He did it because people were just eating up his time at five over 500 an hour. So he doubled the price. I said, I don't care, I'll pay it. So I start paying him a G an hour. And every time I talk to him, I fucking 5X my return. And I'm sending him text messages. I'm sending, not, not text messages, PMs on Facebook. So I said, so I said, and he's going, congratulations. I'm not doing anything, dude. It's all you, man. I'm just pointing you in the direction. You're doing all the work. You're doing all the work. And I'm just like, I'm telling my wife. My wife's like, that's one guy that becomes a line item on your budget and you don't take him off. And so th that's what he's. So, uh, so, so design. He went, he went to Art Center out in LA and he became a, so he went through, he's a designer. No. So he is, he, he's an artist who built a huge business. He did work for Coldplay. He won a Grammy for Niles Barkley. He designed the video for, I remember when, I remember when. He designed that video. Um, he worked with Chris Martin on a couple different projects. So he's worked with some big, big, big businesses. Like you want a logo from him, it's 50 grand. Okay. Okay. I want to learn from that guy. So he becomes a line item on my budget sheet and we create a friendship and relationship. I'm actually flying out there on Sunday and I'm spending two days with him. It's a two day intensive. We start at nine and we just go until we don't go anymore. And he's, I'm basically just opening up everything to him and we're going to just re rewire and, and see what needs to be redone. And, um, this guy has just been a huge, huge, I'll say his name, Chris Doe. And he's just been a huge, huge impact in my life. Like Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn, like he's my Jim Rohn. No, I, you need to cut. I don't need to cut. <laughs> okay. You know the first thing you touched on too, starting off, and 
such a difference, and this is talking back when you first started, talking about when you started off, is just talking and nothing. So many people are afraid to ask, like, oh, don't do that, that doesn't sound good, or sound stupid, that's too risky, don't do this. You'd be amazed what you can get done and what people will do for you if you just ask. It's crazy. I mean, that conversation, you're, you're, you can get the salary, what is it, 30 to 38? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was that outside perspective that said to me, what, you don't think you're worth that? That was the push. That was the push. You know, and there was this thing that happened to me as I was growing. I, you know, my business ran me for many years. Yeah, especially in the nightlife industry where it's, it's, Nasty. Like you're crossing your fingers hoping to get paid at the end of the week. And so I let these folks run my business, dictate the price, dictate when they were going to get it. And that is a, that got like sort, that seeped into my DNA a little bit. And when I started to scale that, some of that stayed. And that is a horrible way to run a business. And I remember that mindset coach in between Russell and like when I really exploded, I only worked with him for about a couple of, a few months, but he said, Henry, why are you tolerating this? You are an amazing designer that worked with Bon Jovi for Christ's sake and has done all of this amazing th things and is living a lifestyle that people fucking dream about. And you're letting this guy fucking, or this gal pussy, like, like push you around? So I said to myself, holy shit, he's got something here. And now not to say that that doesn't seep in on occasion, but I catch it quickly. I'm conscious of it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally get everything you're saying. It makes perfect sense. But it takes time to get there. You can hear it, but you don't feel it until you experience it and put in the years of doing it. Yeah. And, um, um, yeah. It, it, you know the other thing, too, that you're saying? You invest a lot into yourself. And I. I don't do that nearly as much as I probably should after listening to what you're saying. Mm. I would. I mean, like, these classes, because a lot of it's like, ah, oh, fucking scam. I'm coming from this. That's a, that's, so that's a philosophy that you, that you, it may be true. It may be true, but finish your thought. No, but my, the, the, the how can it, I, I guess you have to go in too, to find the right people, right? Yeah. You have to find the right specialists and people right. who are hiring. Right. Um, but you don't think anything else. You get out of it what you want. Or what you put in. Yeah, you take away and then you have to put in. Yes. But you're not going to just, you can't just go to a pony lot and whatever well, you can do generic again. Do it. And, and then expect like my life when you finish, when you get happy. No. No. But you have what, why this works for you too is that you have immediate initiative. So if you take initiative immediately, it's so easy to sit talk. It's very easy to get motivated to get pumped up like a YouTube video. Uh, we'll, we'll rah, up. rah. But uh, if you there's no initiative, and all, you know what a lot of people don't have initiative. Just that first step. They don't like, they go to the gym, uh, they go to mom. But just taking initiative puts you ahead of other people. So it's at least you get that failure out of the way, or, or take some pleasure, you, you know, you learn from it. Either way, it's a learning experience. Listen, here's the thing. When your why gets bigger, your how gets easier. Yeah. So the, when you have bigger reasons to do things, now I got a 19-month-old son at home, right? And when those doubts start to creep into my mind, like I recently took a client on who's a little bit of a, an ego guy and, 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 he's, and he, likes to, he likes to tear you down instead of build you up, right? And that, that's the business that he's in. You know, I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's the way he does business, right? So... I took a couple on the chin when I first started working with him. And then I realized I'm done. I'm good. Because I was conceding. I was letting him dictate my process. That's not going to get him the results that he's looking for. But here's the mindset. So we all have these little tricks in our back pocket that we pull out to help us get through some of these times. Well, here's the one that I use. 
And I use this when I go into conferences and networking events and shit like that because you'll be surprised when I go into a Chamber of Commerce event and there's 300 people walking around, I'm like a little baby in the corner, like scared. I'm like a little introverted. I'm shy. Here's what I do. I think about my son and I say, would Dante want a father who's meek and timid? For my son, right? Or for my wife and for my father. Did my father raise me this way? And then you know the answer. Bam, like that. You go in and my chest's out, I'm, my head's high. I'm open to new, t new people and new communication. And if I get bullied by a client, boom, I go right back to that. What would Dante think? What would my wife think? What would my father think? Those are the three most important people in my life. And immediately switch. Now, instead of attacking, because you don't want to do that, I learned over time that it's all about p positioning your energy and coming at them in a neutral tone in a neutral tone. So instead of lashing out at them, you say along the lines of, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to please you guy. So, you know, here's what we, here's what we, maybe that we have this conversation. You say it with a smile on your face. Maybe we're at a point where we need to dissolve this relationship because I don't want to torture you and I don't want to torture me either. So maybe we figure out what, what, what would be a good severance here? That what would you be comfortable with? And maybe we just part ways. And, and you see how you come at them like that and, and they're like, oh, well, this guy really cares about the, the relationship, right? And he's not attacking me because they want you to, to, to attack back and that's just a pit bull fight that's not gonna end well, right? No. So. You learn, and this is, this is what I'm learning from Chris. And so a couple things here, philosophies. One thing that I, that I realized was I stopped trying to get better at my job and I started getting better at me. It's a whole, it's a whole mind game. And what I started to do was a lot of personal development stuff. And it sounds it sounds woo woo and it's not woo woo. It sounds like, oh, here we go. You know, just change your mindset and everything changes. Yeah. Well, look, go back to that old story of the guy who had two sons. The, and the guy was a complete, the guy, the father was a complete drunk and degenerate. The one son becomes a drunk and, gen, and gen, degenerate. The other son becomes a successful businessman. How does that happen? different philosophies. So my philosophy in life to this day is I'm responsible for everything that happens in my life. If I get hit by a car out there today, crossing the street, it's my fault. I made, I took that step. I take ownership on anything. When a, when a client isn't happy, I take ownership. If a client is happy, I take ownership. If my team comes back with subpar work, I take ownership. And I say to myself, my apologies, I didn't communicate this clearly enough. What do you need from me to make this more articulate? Right. Changes everything. Right. And so, very, very good yeah, yeah. And so that's what I'm learning. So I was thinking about this and I, I, don't, I don't, hopefully I don't get emotional about this, but if I do, I do. I've been thinking about this like, past 48 hours, Sean. So this is like real time. I'm looking back at my life and where I'm at today. Successful business, beautiful family. Like don't have to work for the next two years if I don't have to. Like if I don't want to, I would drive myself crazy if I did. But I'm at that point right now. And I don't have millions in the bank. No, I have a nice, the vaults are filling up nicely, but I don't have multi-millions in the bank, but I'm on, I have a, I have a, 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 a fine, I got financially intelligent over the past couple of months and I know what to do with my money now and it's compounding like a mofo and this is why I'm at the position that I'm at right now. I say to myself, what else do I want? 
right? And so I am at a crossroads in my life right now. Where do you go from here? It's like you have everything you want. What do you do? And so I'm not 100% on where I'm going, but here's where I'm going as of today. It's about giving back and seeing where that goes. Like Dale, Dale Carnegie, right? The first half of his life, he said, I will acquire a fortune. And the, next, and the second half of my life, I will give it all away. So the guy acquires 450 million. By the time he dies, he has given all of that away in charity. That's the way that he wrote that. And that was, that was how he ran his life. I'm almost at that. I feel like I'm at that point. Just not, I don't have 450 million in the bank. You know, I don't, it, money isn't, I realize that money is really nothing. It's what you do with it that creates the, the, the value, yeah. right? It's seriously just, it, it, it's exchanged for value, if you will, right? $20 means nothing. It's what you do with that $20 that makes it worth $20 or more, right? So I'm at the point now where I'm giving out my best stuff and I was mortified of doing that. Oh, well, what if they don't, they don't need me anymore if I just give away my best stuff, right? They'll just take it and run. I, I'm, gen, I'm actually generating more revenues and money now by doing that than I've ever dreamed of by being in this scarcity mindset. So now it's, so I had this conversation with Chris. Where do we go? And he said, Henry, there is nothing worth pr protecting. Everything's been done. Everything's been done. What are you holding on to? He said, here's one thing that nobody could take from you. And it's you. Nobody could shoot a camera like Sean Torrey. They could get close, and if they try to imitate you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look silly at the end of the day. Completely. Yeah, off with your head. Well, here's the competition, Sean. Yourself. That's who you should be competing with. Who you were yesterday. Bro, thousand percent. And you know what? Another interesting thing too is maybe you can relate since you're um sort of what you started from the bottom. Yep. It is like a kid is born into wealth almost assumes you're wealthy. You actually have that money. But if you're not born in that frame of thinking, yeah. you, it's very easy to think for. Yeah. And uh, you take the conscious effort, even like when you're making money, yeah. um, or it's I found to that like, you have to, you have to say, no, I am worthless, right? I, I, uh, belief. Yeah, belief. And, um, and so, like, get that thinking. But it's, it's, it's all internal. It's all internal, dude. Yeah. What? It's a learning process, too. And you know what's also great, too? I'm so happy you shared that, that part, like, the reflection. Yeah. Because, like, people need to hear that, too. Like, it's not all Ferraris. <laughs> when you're out in the field, like, get happy. Yeah. But, you like what you did. You learn. You just learn from these. Um, learn from your failures or your speed bumps, mm -hmm. and you try. Yeah, you don't make. You try not to make the same mistake twice. Right. I did, but I won't make it a third. I can promise you that. And you can't dodge every aspect. You can get rid of these. Right. But um, but it's it's like it's really inspiring to hear that actually because. 
even for me to hear it and for other people too that are pursuing something, even for actors that are working with this too. Because they're in like they're in uncharted waters yeah. and um, and there's constant self doubt. Yeah. There's constant self doubt. Even when you're um, you build confidence as you go along too and you find the successes. But um, it's good to hear that too because it's human. And social media, everyone presents this false sense of what their life is. It's not even there. It's in a parking lot. It's not even there. It's a rented one. Or I don't want to see. Mm-hmm. It's like, so it's important for people to realize it's okay to hit speed bumps. Like, you're going to fall in the ass. It's important to get back up. You learn from it and you, and you move forward and grow. Yeah. That's, I hope, if there's anything that you get out of this conversation today, those folks that are listening is that and to know that there's going to be more coming up and it's not what happens to you it's it's how you react to what's happening to you that's what changes everything you know i i am quick to course correct quicker than ever these days when i see something happen i go okay why did that piss me off why am i still pissed why am i even still thinking about this how do i fix this and every morning i i either i it's either every morning or every night, but at least once a day, I will, I go to a YouTube channel. It's called Power Thoughts. It's a meditation channel and there's tons of, of videos that you just, you could listen to or watch. It's more listening than watching. And in the morning, I'll listen to it. I'll find it like a 15 minute one and I'll listen to it. And that's my meditation for the day. Uh, or right before I go to bed, I'll throw it on. And I, and I meditate, and that is, it, it's getting very cliche these days, but let me tell you something, when you're working at this level and you wanna work at a peak performance all the time, you need to keep your mind right, because that is the operating system that's gonna operate your business, truly. If that's not operating right, your business won't. I can promise you that. So focusing in on your mindset and making sure that you're putting positivity in, your 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 you're just blocking out all the nonsense and consider the source. I was just, I was watching this Ed Milet video coming into the city today. I was listening to it, not watching it. Obviously I was driving, but he was talking about dream killers and what most people do to kill their dreams. And it's they, they let the haters get the best of them. But he mentioned that not everybody is a hater. Not everyone is a hater. You need to consider the source. Your mom and dad are not haters. They're, they have your best interests in mind. Maybe they're just scared that you're taking a, a risk that they've never taken before. The point that he was trying to say was, when you get this information coming at you, the first thing you gotta ask yourself is, is this person an antagonist? Are they for me or against me? And if they're against me, out it goes. You don't even bother to compute right? It's just out in the garbage. But if they are trying to help you, consider the source. So my uncle, he's an extremely successful businessman. He's been married four times. I'll take his business advice. I will not take his marriage advice. Sorry, Uncle Joe. I love you to death. It is what it is. So you want to take the advice from the people that are successful in what it is that you want to become successful in. So people come to me they have a great product or service. They have a business that's, that's, that's picking up a lot of momentum, but they don't know their ass from their elbow when it comes to positioning it, branding it, scaling it. That's what they're coming to me for. And so I've done it with my own business. I have proof to show it. That's why they come to me. They're not coming to me for dating advice. <laughs> They're not coming to me for marriage advice, even though they should, because you know what? The, my marriage is as healthy as it has been. We've known each other 11 years, been married seven, and our relationship and marriage is stronger this year than any year ever. And I, I, yes, yes, and I've seen it. And we go to, you know, we go to therapy and it is proactive. It's not reactive therapy. And I'll tell you, my our 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 therapist said something in our last call and our last meeting that that made us both sort of like say, "Holy shit!" Her name's Annette. She says Annette says to us, "We're both sitting on the couch," and she said, "Let me tell you something, you two. She's an Italian Italian woman. She said, Let me tell you something, you two. 
You're both warriors, she said. A lot of, a lot of husband and wives come through my door. And she said, none of them, in my opinion, work as hard as you two. You are warriors. And that right there tells me a lot about her, about me, about how we're being perceived from an outside. We wouldn't see that in ourselves. And that, that's how we use therapy. We don't use it to bitch and moan about each other for an hour. We go there to get an outside perspective and, under, and get that new, neutral, arbitrative of voice to say, all right, Tori, you're being a little crazy. You're trying to get this person to shop at Marshall's when, he's, when he loves shopping at Gucci, and you just got to accept that, right? And Henry, you're trying to get her to shop at Gucci when she would just love to just be at Marshall's all day. And that's the relationship that we have. And we're starting to really accept each other and know that we are, we still love each other despite our different value, uh, looks on value. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to watch as a father, a husband, uh, you know, somebody who just wants to be a better version of themselves every day. So. <laughs> Dude, that is how you win, in my opinion. That is how you win. You, you, you got to cut the cancer fast. You know, I look at it as cancer. If you let this go too long, it's going to take over. So you get it, get it cut out quick or get it resolved quick or get it fixed quick. I'm not trying to be a Facebook ads guy. I'm not trying to be a YouTube genius. I'm not trying to be a, uh, 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 an expert designer anymore. Like I have the team to do that. Like my team is better than me at design and it, that is, that was done purposely. That, that is done purposely. Now what's, what's unique about me is if I got to jump in there and roll up my sleeves and get something done because it just needs to be done, I can do it. And that, that not too many people can do that. And so, you know, one of the things is you gotta, you gotta invest in a high income skill set. You did it. Not everybody could shoot that camera like you. And man, you do some hell of a job, man. Right? And that's your height. Without you, they don't have a, they don't exist on the internet. Bro, that's how valuable you are. Without you, they don't exist on the internet. Right? And so we'll have a conversation offline about positioning your value and understanding how important you are. Gary Vee just said this on a, so my mentor had him on his show and Gary, and he asked the question to Gary, where, what role do creatives play in entrepreneurship and in business? And he said, they play the role. Without powerful creative, the business will fail. That pumped me up. That pumped me up because I said, he's damn right. If their brand identity blows, if their, if their brand messaging is off by a two centimeters, they're going to attract the wrong client. They're going to attract the wrong business. They're not going to have a business. If their copy and creative doesn't grab people's attention or make something better for someone, they're dead. So if you're going to nickel and dime me, then you're not my client, right? If you understand the value of brand in 2019, bro, it's only getting worse or better for us because they need us more now than ever. Isn't it weird how a good headshot back in the day was a luxury? <laughs> and now it's become a necessity. Quality brand determines the quality of your clients, and I will live and die by that, that key phrase. And I have 
I have training after training and training online about how important that is in 2019. And creative is the variable. Brand is the variable. And if you don't have a well-positioned, polished, professional brand, you will not survive. <laughs> and that's why it's so important to do what you do. And, oh, I'm sorry, position you, Sean. I'm, I'm, now I'm coaching you. But, like, this is how, why it's so important for you to understand that. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll give you another case study real quick. My client today, he's a chiropractor. And this guy is the salt of the earth, right? He does really good. He's like a specialist in this one particular pain where nobody knows how to fix it but him in the state of New Jersey. And he, he came to me last year mortified of social media. I, it was like pulling teeth to get him in front of a camera. I coached him. And he said, okay, I'm good for now. Let me get out there and bust my ass and apply some of the stuff that you coached me on and let me, let me do some work. So I let him go. He hits me back up two weeks ago, pays me $10,000, sends me a check for 10 grand. He goes, what's this gonna get me? I said, four calls. He said, okay, done. You gotta see this guy on social media. He's Instagram story beast. He's out there showing people. He's, show, he's got patients in the, in the chair. He's doing tutorials on there. He's an absolute beast on social media. Really? Now he's, hit a, he's got a nine-month-old baby. He's trying to do everything. He's trying to like be a, and I So he was getting a little overwhelmed on today's call. And I said, Chris, let's take a time out. Because he said, I'm going back to basics here. You gave me so much in these past three calls. Like I need some time to actually execute. And I said, take, 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 take all the time you need. I said, but do me a favor, because I fell into this mistake too. I said, what is the top five things that you've been most proud of over the past year? What are the top five accomplishments that you've been proud of over the past, five, uh, past year? And you could see. He takes a deep breath as Adam's apple gets huge. And like you could see like the emotion come over his face. I said, let me tell you something, Chris. I said, you have done things in the past year that people will not be able to do in a lifetime. And I had to remind him, you've come a long way on social media, dude. You were scared. And now you're a beast on social media. Look at the impact that you're making out there on, on, and look how far you've come. Have you taken a second to celebrate that? And dude, he's fighting back the tears now. Mm. And I said, I appreciate you and I am so proud of you to see how far you've come in such short time. You could heard a pin drop. And the crackle in his voice. Mm. All he could get out was thank you. And that is an example of knowing what you're worth to someone. And that is brand. It's the feeling that you transfer to someone. I always laugh. I always talk about you, Sean, when I'm talking to clients about photo shoots, and I tell them if you're if you could fly to New York, you have to use Sean because of the feeling that he gives you in his studio. He makes you do funny things to create different to 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 activate different muscles in your mouth to get that react to get that feeling portrayed out. Who does that? Besides Sean, maybe there's a few diamonds in the rough out there, but I, I've gotten a couple shoots done by different people and no one has ever made me do these quirky things to get that look, that, that perfect emotion. That's brand. It's how you leave them. It's how you make them feel at the end, at the end of the day. And so I'm, it's funny because I, when you come to my website and you come to 
my social media presence. I'm not doing enough of that, I believe, because I just interviewed a client and we did a whole case study about him. And he said, dude, you've created such a beast out of me. You didn't market that to me when I first invested in you. He's like, I didn't even know I was getting this stuff. He's like, I texted you at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night because I was stuck and you responded. And then when you saw me doing stupid shit on Instagram, you texted me and said, take that down. That's not on brand. I didn't know I was signing up for that. I go, I'm doing a poor job marketing myself, aren't I? So this is why I'm doing more of this. And so what I want to leave you with and leave everybody that's listening is there's a cliche out there going out right now, right? Know your worth. Yes, you need to know your worth, but you need to focus more on that feeling you want to leave that person with after they interact with you. So when, if you're an actor and you're trying out, you want to get in front of that panel and leave them in tears, period. Have them blown away. Where in, 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 that they, they will f- never forget you, right? That's the feeling that you want to leave them with. Like, you're going to be a different person, Sean, after this interview. And I made a promise to myself when everything got better over the past 18 months, I said, my philosophy will be this, and it's not for everybody. But no matter who I interact with or comes in my vicinity, I will leave them better than when I found them. And that is how I'm living my life until I die. And that's it. And that's it. And I know it's not for everybody. Some people are like, shut that fucking guy up already. He's, he's enough. But then there's other people that will take away what I say or how I've made them feel and they'll never forget it. And that's... And that goes back to my mom and dad trying for 16 years, almost losing me after two years, and knowing that I'm on borrowed time, and that's where that all comes from. So that's my story. (laughs) Thank you. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you. I wouldn't usually schlep an hour and a half into the city for, for just anybody, and I said, you know, Sean has been such a... Oh, positive contribution to unique designs and my personal brand. And I could not be positioned the way that I am today on social. Well, you help tremendously. Don't dummy yourself down. Yeah. You are a huge contributor to the success of my brand. And so I want to thank you for it. That ship sailed. Yep, yep. Thank you. I appreciate that. Wow. <laughs> I should be all right. I should be. No, no, we're good. We're good. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> uh, that's it, dude. You got it.